Hi, I'm Paul Thanlund, editor and publisher of the Capital Times, and I'd like to welcome you to this Cap Times Idea Fest session featuring Richard Graber, who heads the Wisconsin-based Bradley Foundation. This is our fourth annual event, but the first that we are presenting virtually. Our theme this year is 2020 Changes Everything. Given the local and regional impact of COVID-19, the resulting economic damage, and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot to talk about, and we think this is our best lineup yet. We believe IdeaFest has grown into a signature event on the Madison calendar. It's also an important showcase for the Capital Times, our locally owned and century-old journalism brand. If you're not already, we hope you'll consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. I'd like to thank the Burrish Group at UBS, which is the presenting sponsor of IdeaFest and has been with us since the start. Andy Burrish and Jason Moss have built their asset management firm's stellar reputation by effectively investing for Madisonians, but also for investing in Madison. Their generous support of IdeaFest is but one example of their community commitment. As I said earlier, this session features Richard Graber, whose Bradley Foundation has grown to become one of the country's foremost funding and strategy sources for conservative thought. The Burrish Group is the sponsor of this session and joins the Capital Times in its commitment to presenting ideological diversity at IdeaFest. Again, thank you and welcome. Hi, welcome to Cap Times IdeaFest. I'm Caitlin Farrell, the investigative reporter for the Cap Times, and I'm here today with Rick Graber, president and CEO of the Bradley Foundation. Uh, the Bradley Foundation is one of the largest funders of conservative uh, causes and organizations in the country, and it awards grants between $35 and $45 million annually to hundreds of public charities in Milwaukee and across the country. The principles that guide their grant giving are constitutional order, informed citizens, free markets, and civil society. And Rick is here with me today, and I'm going to ask him a few questions about uh, what, what's going on with the organization and, and what's, what is guiding uh, what they're doing. So prior to taking the reins of the Bradley Foundation in 2016, uh, Rick also served as the Senior Vice President for Global Government Relations for the Honeywell International, and he was also the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic from 2006 to 2009. Um, well, thanks so much for being, for, for coming on down to, from Milwaukee today. <laughs> Hi, Caitlin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know, how you view um, how, how the politics of conservatism has ha affects the perception and maybe the efficacy of the types of conservative philanthropy that you do, um, and also just how you, you know, in your role leading the organization really distinguish between the role that you have and the perception that the general public might have that you're just an arm of the Republican Party. Well, there's a real important distinction there. That as, a, as a private foundation, we're a 501c3, so we just don't get involved in politics. We can't get involved in politics. We cannot give to a political campaign. We can only give to charities, other 501c3 organizations. So the politics come and go, the politicians come and go, but the Bradley Foundation continues on. And, and it really is our job uh, it, it, it's our mission to fulfill the wishes of our founders. Two brothers who grew up on the east side of Milwaukee, Lyndon and Harry Bradley, uh, who built an incredible company called the Allen Bradley Company. Most people in Milwaukee will be familiar with that name uh, to this day. But when that company ultimately sold in the mid-1980s, some of the proceeds of the sale ended up into what is today the Bradley Foundation. So it's our job to fulfill what their wishes would have been uh, were they still with us today? It's tough to do. Lyne Bradley died in 1942, Harry Bradley in 1965, so they've been gone a long time. But our board has worked really hard to, to, to try to determine some guiding principles, and you talked about them. Uh, constitutional order was something of great interest, so we fund organizations that preserve that constitutional order. Free markets, they believe deeply in free markets. They think that created the opportunity to build a company like the Allen Bradley Company. Strong civil society, they thought was a really important component in America. Uh, and, and it also thought that it was really important to have an informed citizenry. And that uh, 
deals, in our case, with a lot of our efforts in the education space, higher education, K through 12. What do you think, you had kind of mentioned that, you know, they, the brothers, you know, passed away many years ago, and I think the conservative movement back then probably looks a bit different than, sure it's different. you know, how it looks today. What do you think that they would think about what the movement looks like today? Well, the brothers, the, 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 I think they'd be frustrated with parts of the way the world looks today. I think they'd be frustrated with uh, the the size of the federal government, government in general. Uh, they believed in limited government. Um, and they believed in a lot of freedom for individuals. And I think they would see that, that some of that freedom has been encroached upon. Uh, I, I, I think they'd be frustrated with some of the breakdown of family that, that we see in our society. Uh, so, so there are a number of areas where they wouldn't be happy, but their faith in this country their faith in the, in the institutions of America would be as strong as ever. Uh, the, the opportunity that this country presents that no other country on the planet presents is still there. And the brothers would recognize that uh, and, and would fight hard to restore, strengthen, and protect those principles and institutions that enabled their success. Well, so one of the things that, um, that you know, I'm not sure, I guess, if the general public really has a great grasp on this, but, you know, the, the foundation, I know, gives millions of dollars to arts institutions and, you know, the fine arts, the, this new symphony center in Milwaukee is going to be, you know, named after the, the Bradley brothers. And um, I think, in what way do you, do you really link the fine arts as really being emblematic of these conservative values? How do they, how, how are those values really manifested in that way? I think... Um, you know, people might, maybe cla classical fine arts might be a bit different, but I think maybe the general public might think that, you know, being, being promoting... How can a conservative organization fund the arts? How right, can that be? right. It's a more maybe <laughs> liberal venture um, that, that the arts are important. So how do you, you know, what's your approach to that and why sure. do you think that... Sure. I mean, you mentioned the, the Bradley Symphony Center and we should mention that for just a second. Um, we're really proud. It, it, uh, will be the largest gift that the Bradley Foundation has ever made. And we did it in partnership with Harry Bradley's grandson, uh, David Eline, his wife, uh, Julie, and, and his sister, Lined. Uh, and together between the family and the foundation, it was, it was over a $52 million grant to build what will be an incredible facility on Wisconsin, Wisconsin Avenue, west of the river in Milwaukee. So it's just really, really exciting. But why? Um, in part, it goes back to donor intent. The, the Bradley brothers and their wives cared deeply about the arts, and they thought that the arts in Milwaukee was a really important part of Milwaukee being a great city. They, th they saw it as part of a strong civil society where people can come together and put aside political differences and go to the symphony or go to the repertory theater or go to the opera, um, you know, any number of wonderful arts organizations that exist in Milwaukee. And really the arts in Milwaukee, for a city that size, uh, play far above their weight. Uh, I mean, it's an incredible arts community in Milwaukee and Bradley's been proud to be there. And again, I think it goes back to the donor intent of our founders. They saw it as important and it really is an important part of a strong civil society in a city like Milwaukee, and it's true across the country. Our focus on the arts has been in primarily Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, too, I know that obviously the organization is based in Milwaukee and you, you fund a lot of organizations there, but you have a huge footprint nationally as well. Can we do. You talk a bit about what, what the breakdown is there and, you know, with you at the helm, kind of where your focus is as far as, you know, the types of groups that you're funding Milwaukee versus across the country? Sure, sure. Uh, traditionally, uh, about 30% of our annual giving stays in Milwaukee and Wisconsin, and it's not just Milwaukee, it is throughout the entire state of Wisconsin, and about 70% goes to organizations around the country. Uh, there have been discussion over the years at, at the Bradley Foundation about our local giving, and, and our board, which consists of people from all over the country and local people, have, have felt very strongly that there has to be a major commitment uh, to Milwaukee because Lyndon and Harry cared so much about Milwaukee and Wisconsin. Um, 
it, it, it would be wrong not to have a substantial part of our annual budget dedicated to Milwaukee and Wisconsin, again, because of what they would have wanted. Uh, other organizations around the country really, uh, and, and it's true in Milwaukee and Wisconsin, fall into one of those four buckets, if you will, constitutional order, free markets, civil society, uh, informed citizens. Uh, we do lots of work in higher education uh, with, with different centers uh, at universities around the country, focusing on um, uh, civics and history, things that we think aren't being taught enough in the schools these day. We do a tremendous amount with uh, policymakers in the free markets area, uh, the administrative state, limited government. Um, that's really what Lind and Harry felt so deeply about is that they were able to start their business. They had a lot of stops and starts. They almost went bankrupt a couple times, but the beauty of America, unlike many other places, is that they were able to start again and ultimately be very, very successful. Government didn't get in the way. They had to pick themselves up, start over again, and then history tells us they succeeded and succeeded very well. So one thing I, I wanted to ask you is just about when you're talking about strengthening, strengthening civil society, you know, we yeah. see, what's, what do you see that the foundation's role is in addressing some of the most pernicious problems in Milwaukee? We see that, you know, nationally, it's the, one of the most segregated cities in the country. It's infant and maternal mortality rates are quite high. And, um, you know, both in the health and economic realm, depending on, you know, what zip code you end up in growing up in that city, um, you know, it can be, it can be a lot more difficult. And so what, what kind of role does the foundation take in addressing some of these real systemic problems that have persisted there for a while? Some, some really big roles, often quiet roles. Uh, the brothers believe deeply in the dignity of every single person. They believe deeply in the dignity that comes from work and the opportunity that comes from work. Um, the organizations that we fund uh, in Milwaukee, and there are many of them, are, are, are run by some of the unsung heroes uh, in our community. Often these organizations don't take a nickel of government support, uh, but they are out there person by person solving the tough problems with drug abuse, with um, um, family violence, um, with finding a job, with, with contributing to society in some way. There's a great organization, organizations such as Running Rebels that was started by a man named Victor Barnett uh, and together with his wife Dawn uh, have done tremendous work on keeping kids coming out of really tough situations out of the juvenile justice system. It started through basketball leagues but it's turned into a much larger organization than that. Uh, or a woman named Ashley Thomas who works at Hope Street Ministries uh, again dealing with families uh, who, who are facing drug issues, who are facing homelessness, who are facing uh, being out of work, bringing those families together in a very caring community uh, and working with them to, to get them back on their feet and, and functioning uh, in our society. Um, we don't think government is the answer and it is civil society, it is, it is neighborhoods, it's churches, it's schools, it's private organizations, voluntary organizations, in a very bottom-up way that make the most difference in our community. It's not another government program throwing more money at it. It's really brave, driven, inspiring people, people that are making the difference. And I guess the other area that, I, that I'd want to talk about at some length is um, parental choice. Bradley Foundation was really at the forefront of school choice, parental choice uh, in Milwaukee. And in, in the midst of the pandemic we're in, I, th I think it's an issue that has really come to the forefront as most public schools, including the Milwaukee public schools, have remained closed while a large number of the choice and charter schools have tried to open up. Parents, not some bureaucrat, parents, are the best people to decide where their kids should go to school. They're the best judges of whether it should be in a public school, not against public schools, but there are other options. Private schools, charter schools, homeschooling. You see a lot of pods right now. 
Um, we, we talk about racism in our society. This is one of the areas that needs to be fixed, is where every kid, regardless of zip code, has an opportunity to go to the school of his choice and get a good education. Our promise to the kids should be, in this country, a good education, a quality education, no matter what your background is. It should not be what teachers' unions think, in their mind, is the best solution. We're failing on that in this country. There's not a big city public school in this country that is performing well. Can you name one? There, there really aren't. The, op the opportunity now is to build on that. And the facts, and this has been a 35-year experiment since school choice started in Milwaukee, and slowly but surely the facts are becoming very clear that the opportunity in choice and charter schools for these kids is better than the opportunity that they're currently getting in the public, through the public school system. How do you feel about, um, I think one, you know, one criticism that, I, that I've heard in regards to that type of policy too is just needing to have real accountability for you know, people that have, people, families that have vouchers and public dollars that are flowing to private schools. Um, accountability in the same way that public schools have to account for money that, you know, that, that the public is giving them through their tax dollars. How do you feel about, about that issue? And, and you had said you know, that, that the facts are, are slowly becoming clear, but um, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of, you know, Milwaukee hasn't made it in, in, in overcoming some of these problems in its education system, despite the fact that we've had choice over the last three decades or so. so you know, I understand that it's a big challenge to solve, but what might you say to, to those who, who criticize that the same level of accountability isn't there, and it should be when we're talking about public dollars, but also that, you know, we've seen this. We've seen it expand to the southern part of the state as well, and, you know, Wisconsin, I know, has been a model for these other types of programs, along with Florida um, and in other states across the country, too. So how might, what, how might you respond There's to that? There's lots of accountability, and that, that is, I think, a myth that you hear out of the opponents to choice and charter schools. They're taking the same tests. Uh, there are comparisons on reading scores and math scores, and frankly, the results are better in the choice and charter schools than they are in the public schools. But it goes beyond that. Uh, there, there have been some great studies uh, in recent years that have shown that long-term, kids that are attending the choice and charter schools are uh, less likely to go in the juvenile justice system, are more likely to graduate and stay in college, uh, so more uh, able to contribute to um, our society as a whole. Uh, so there's lots of accountability, plus the market is accountable. You know, when schools don't work, parents don't send their kids there and those schools don't make it. The marketplace works. Uh, as opposed to when you have a monopoly of just public schools. Uh, and I would urge all of those critics to come with me to the Milwaukee Academy of Science or to Milwaukee Excellence or to Milwaukee College Prep and just walk through the hallways uh, with me and, and observe. See what you see. See how you see kids are reacting to teachers and are learning. Uh, learn what the culture is in those schools and you can figure it out in about five minutes uh, and you'll see a difference and you'll see kids that are thriving as opposed to kids in the public school who are not getting the same opportunity. They simply are not. Uh, so before you criticize, do your due diligence is what I would say. So pivoting from that a bit, I think, um, and you know what, what you'd be proposing I think and having kind of a dialogue of ideas is something that unfortunately seems to be more challenging, you know, not only because we're in a pandemic, but just the nature of how fractured and polarized that we're becoming. Um, and so I'm curious your thoughts on the, another thought that critics, critics might say as far as how the conservative movement has evolved over the last several years and party politics in general, you know, how do you feel about the evolution of that and the way that it's contributed or diminished to our ability to have civil discourse as a society and really be able to, in a good natured way, talk about our policy disagreements. I think, um, you know, that seems to fit too in what the brothers had in mind and um, especially the role of the arts there too. But um, I mean, I think one thing that I find sad is that it's, it's difficult to find a safe space or, you know, um, 
an opportunity to really have those types of conversations with an open mind. Um, I guess, what do you think about that? I mean, I, civil discourse in our society is, is really important. And I, I guess I would ask for examples where the, the center right is, is seeking to curtail that. Uh, when, when you look at where things are today, the left really controls universities across this country for the most part in terms of philosophy. The left controls a big chunk of the mainstream media uh, as you think about it. You can't pick up the New York Times or the Washington Post or uh, even the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for that matter and not see a very slanted presentation of uh, what's going on in our city or our country, uh, especially when it comes to politics. And politics has clearly um, divided this country. Um, you know, you look on college campuses and you see certain speakers like um, actually the woman that I used to work for, Secretary Condoleezza Rice, was disinvited uh, from a college campus because people didn't want to hear what she had to say, or at least the powers that be on campus didn't want to hear what she had to say, and that's wrong. So, you know, from, from media to universities to um, so much of the, the unrest we see in cities these days, um, I don't think that's coming from the center right. Well, I think that there... <laughs> and I am all in favor of these kinds of conversations, and I, and I invite having conversations. In fact, I recently gave a commencement address at Lakeland University and urged people to become friends with someone they disagree with. Just have a conversation and, and talk it out. But there's such uh, vitriol and... Uh, you just can't have those conversations anymore. People are, there have been polling done that shows that people are losing friends, that aren't speaking to family members anymore because of politics, and it's very sad. We shouldn't look at ourselves as being in a tribe, that we're, we're some identity, we're black or we're white or we're brown or we're, we're some other tribe. We should look at ourselves as Americans. And, and realize what we have in this country and what this country has afforded so many people. Is it perfect? No. It, far from it. There's a lot of work to be done. But this is still the greatest country on earth and we had to work on what has worked so well for a couple of centuries. I think that, um, you know, it's, I think it's difficult to, I, I agree with you, and I think that it's difficult to um, you know, every time we go through an election cycle, you know, most recently in this country, it's the very, the, in, the very inherent way that these campaigns are structured is that this is a fight for the, you know, the heart of our country and that the other side wants to destroy the country and, you know, the other side hates America. And, and it's rhetoric like that that, and I, I understand, you know, if you, we can't really delve into party politics or your thoughts on Donald Trump, but I think that it's it's um, valid and warranted for many folks, even folks that don't cover, you know, follow politics often, to say, you know, the the president of our country and the, therefore the leader of the conservative movement is is saying things that further inflame, you know, these you know, this type of rhetoric and saying that those that disagree with him politically want to destroy the country and hate America. Um, and I think that that type what, of rhetoric... What does tearing down statues or looting cities accomplish? What, what has all that accomplished? N nothing. We should be focused on, on places where we can try to make a difference. And I would again point to education. I would again point to strengthening family. But you don't hear these issues being discussed. That's how you give people um, who are coming from tough backgrounds a chance. You gotta have a good education. And if you're coming from a strong family, your odds are just much better. Uh, I mean, it, it's intuitive, but it, it's also been proven. And that's not what's being discussed. Instead, we're tearing down statues of Ulysses Grant. Come on. So how do we create a more informed society? What, what do you think is a solution to um, 
you know, the uh, traditional mainstream media, the avenues there that, that the country has relied upon. Um, I mean, there, there's a plethora of media organizations, you know, both more center right now, ones that are more left. Um, what are your thoughts, I guess, yeah, I mean, on the best I way mean, to... We don't, we don't focus extensively on media at the Bradley Foundation, but I, you know, the people are frustrated with mainstream media, and I think as a result of that, because, I mean, why are they frustrated? Because they think they're not getting a straight story. The front page has become an editorial page, and that's unfortunate. That, I mean, let pe people are smart enough. Let them decide. Give us, uh, as best you can, Mr. or Miss Reporter, an unbiased view, and then let the people decide. But that doesn't happen. Um, so I think as a result, you've seen a lot, seen lots of different kinds of media out there. You've got social media, which, you know, is a great thing, but also a, a bad thing in, in some ways. I think people become very dependent on that. I think in a way they communicate less with other people as a, as a result of having your phone and, and being able to communicate constantly in, in that way. So I think there are negatives to that, but I, I think part of the reaction to what is no longer an unbiased mainstream media is all this other stuff um, that has come up. And it, as I said, it, it's good and bad. It's instant information, it's 24-7 information, uh, but in a lot of ways I think it's made people in general lonelier, if you will, uh, because it's just so easy to look at your phone and communicate that way. instead of talking to someone, talking to your neighbor. Um, you know, it, it sounds sort of old-fashioned perhaps and uh, trite, but make some friends in your neighborhood. Uh, people will help you out when you're in a pinch. Not enough of that happens anymore. Um, pivoting a little bit, one thing I had wanted to ask you about was your, your tenure when you served as ambassador to the Czech Republic under George W. Bush. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that experience was like and how it has informed your work now leading the Bradley Foundation and really affected you as a person? I mean, that's a pretty, living abroad, I think, always sort of changes the way we understand ourselves and our country. Yeah. But for you to be the ambassador, that's a, that's a big one. It was a, a fabulous experience for me, for my wife, for our kids. Um, just the opportunity to represent this country every single day for almost three years um, was amazing. Um, it, it was an opportunity that I never expected. Um, frankly, I didn't ask for it, and, and when I was asked, um, I was a bit taken aback, but uh, w just what an incredible experience. Um, and, and, and you do learn a lot about yourself um, and you learn about your country, the importance of America. A little country like the Czech Republic with 10 million people um, always looked to America, still does look to America, not always in agreement, but um, looks to what America is doing. Uh, and I guess one of the things I learned about our country was the incredible spirit of giving that is here. I remember I tried to organize some volunteer activities at the embassy and in communities around the Czech Republic. Uh, and it didn't take me long to figure out that just sort of the natural giving back, either through resources or time, to um, our communities and to our country is just not a natural part of the culture outside of this country. I don't think it's anywhere in the world like it is here where it's just something that's part of our DNA. Um, and in fact, the, the statistics will bear that out. The, the amount that Americans contribute to charity is over 5% of uh, gross national product. Um, the next closest country is somewhere under two. And the number of hours that people volunteer are in the billions, uh, again, among the top uh, around the world. Um, so when we talk about American exceptionalism, when we talk about a strong civil society, it really is a unique part uh, of living in this country. And you take it for granted, unless you've been somewhere else, and see that it's just not. We, we lived in Belgium 
too for a while, which is a very split country between um, the, the French side and the Flemish side. And the two sides really don't like each other or communicate a whole lot. And there's no sense of country or, or giving back, at least not in the same way. Um, so I, th I, th I think through that experience, um, I appreciated more than ever uh, how fortunate we are to have been born in this country and to have the opportunities and the freedoms that this country offers. Um, and I think that's forgotten uh, an awful lot. Did, I'm curious, you know, in that, in your role particularly in the Czech Republic, you were, um, you know, a part of the government as the ambassador. I and was. I know you had, I know the contexts are different. You had said, you know, before that government is not the answer. And I know in that context you're talking about, you know, locally and this is a bit different. But, you know, I think in the, the U.S.'s role in the world and the way that, you know, our diplomatic systems are set up, um, that's something that folks would say is a pretty important government function that you were, you got to see the inside of. How did, how, what was that experience like and how did that, um, how did you feel about kind of what you were able to see and how government, you know, yeah. whether government was important I, I in mean, that I, world? I'm not, I'm not saying at all, don't misinterpret me. I'm, I'm not um, uh, an anarchist. I, <laughs> I, there is a role for government and there's an important role for government. Uh, as an ambassador, you, you have lots of different roles. My biggest issue while there was uh, President Bush uh, was trying to persuade the Czech government, the Czech people, to um, partake in, in building a missile defense system uh, to protect against rock, rockets coming out of Iran. Um, uh, at, at that time, and to this day, the Iranians are uh, threatening to build nuclear weapons. and. The hope was to put a, a, a missile defense system into the Czech Republic and Poland that would protect against that. Hugely controversial, but a uniquely government role. That, that's not something that the private sector can do because that was a, a negotiation between the United States and the Czech Republic and Poland. Ultimately failed uh, when President Obama took over and had different views on, on that particular issue. Uh, but so much of what government does is facilitate the private sector. A big part of the job of an ambassador is to promote American business. Uh, and there are a lot of American businesses uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, companies like my former employer, Honeywell, uh, Johnson Controls, um, several uh, Wisconsin companies, Harley-Davidson uh, also had a presence there. Um, and, and part of the job of an ambassador is to promote those businesses and to create opportunities for those businesses to do business overseas. Very fun. And part of it is just talking about America. You're, you're a salesman and a promoter for America. Um, the, there were some incredible moments. And there's incredible goodwill in that part of Europe towards America as well because it was Patton's army that liberated the, the western part of what was then Czechoslovakia, and uh, there are wonderful celebrations every year celebrating that liberation. Um, so many Czechs would say, boy, I wish Patton had kept going. Uh, maybe we wouldn't have had to endure those 40 years of Soviet domination. So it's a multifaceted job. It's a salesman. It's, it's working on government treaties and negotiations and the like. It's promoting American business. And it's just, as the word says, being an ambassador for this country. It was incredibly fun. I, I enjoyed every single day. Great. Well, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors, but we'll be right back with Rick Raber. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors, our Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. 
Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Hi, we're back with Rick Raber. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the rub or really interplay between, again, party politics and principled conservatism and the work that you do with that. Um, you know, you noted in your 2019 annual review of the foundation um, that Harry Bradley wrote, one of the founders, that a nation's progress is measured by the character of its people and not by the promises of its politicians. And so I was wondering, do you think party politics and the partisan gamesmanship often involved in that can or has sullied what principled conservatism hopes to achieve? Yeah, I, I mean, again, at, at Bradley, we, we try to take a long view. Um, and I've been involved on the political side of things in prior lives myself. I was chairman of the Republican Party in Wisconsin and um, obviously worked for a Republican administration. Um, and in foundation world and what we're trying to do really does take a, a longer perspective. And it's, it's different. So what's going on in today's politics isn't necessarily what we're going to be focused on. Our job is to try to do what Harry Bradley would have wanted us to do. And I, I so wish that Line and Harry were around today that so we could have some of these conversations and, and understand more how they would want us to spend their money. Um, so, so in that sense, I don't think it's, it's impacting um, what we do every day. Um, we, can, we take the long view uh, there are plenty of things going on right now with this Republican administration that uh, the, the, the Bradley Foundation would, would focus in a different direction. Um, free markets, um, tariffs, uh, things where government is imposing themselves on the, the free working of markets. Uh, is, is not something that we support. And I think it's a great example. You, you said before, is the Bradley Foundation an arm of the Republican Party? No. I mean, first of all, we can't and won't. But second of all, we're not. Um, we're, we're, we're supporting organizations and, and um, policy makers uh, that you know, have, have a different view than the president does on free markets. We're much more free market, I think, than the current administration would be. But that's okay. Again, we're taking a long view on this. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, though, I don't, I don't know if you're able to speak to this, but I'm curious, you as a person, because yep. you've, you've had such a tenure in both worlds, um, you know, and you've been able to see both on the state level, obviously, in the national and international level, and obviously you, you believe in promoting the goals that the, the Bradley Foundation obviously is also promoting and, and you, were, you had wanted to promote the goals of the Republican Party when you led that. <laughs> and so how do, you, how do you personally feel about um, you know, both approaches, I guess? And, and, and again, maybe they serve different roles in kind of advancing you know, the same, yeah, the same I mean, objectives. They're, they're... But I think that there's... I think that you know probably for at least a chunk of people, there's maybe cynicism about what party politics, that party politics doesn't leave much room, particularly in, a, in an election year, um, to really have you know in-depth discussions about policy and you know conservative philosophy and and why why certain things are being promoted. Um, how do you feel about what you've seen? Uh, I, I mean, I personally, I, I do get frustrated with the cynicism that's out there and the, the inability of uh, our, our elected officials to agree on almost anything these days. Uh, I mean, I found it personally hugely frustrating when uh, Senator Scott from South Carolina introduced a very thoughtful police reform uh, initiative only to have it tossed aside by the uh, leadership in the, in the uh, United States Senate, the Democratic leadership in the Senate. There was an opportunity to make a difference. 
um, and, and to do something quickly and, and to do something effectively. And so, in, in, in a way, that's why I really enjoy the job I have right now because it, it, I, I am living in a world right now where it's not dependent on the next election or the current election or you know what, whatever the fight of the day is. It's, it's really trying to spend money in a way that will make this country stronger and better. As our mission says, to, to restore, strengthen, and protect the principles and institutions that have made this country unique and exceptional. That's what we do every single day, and, 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 and that's fun. And, and we should be promoting, both sides, left and right, should be promoting a more civil discourse. And, and the, the incredible genius of our founders created a country and, and a governance of this country that kind of demands compromise. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, neither side is going to get everything they want, but these days, neither side is getting anything, um, which I, I, I think is a frustration. Ronald Reagan always talked about getting, um, it's better to get 70% of something than nothing, um, and then next year get the other 30%. Um, we've lost some of that. Um, and again, I, I, th I really do think it goes back to thinking of ourselves as American, about being citizens of this country, and that gets at civil society, um, and not um, victims or, you know, part of a tribe, a black tribe, a brown tribe, a white tribe, a name your tribe. We don't think about what's in the best interest of this country enough, and I think the same is true in education. I don't think the kids are coming first. Um, the kids that are coming out of really, really tough backgrounds, tough family situations, tough zip codes, if you will, uh, they're not coming first. It's teachers unions or, or adults that are on a power play. Um, and it, it, it's frankly disgusting and it's, it's not what should be happening in this country. There are opportunities to work together to solve some of these problems. Maybe it means some change from the way we've done it for the last 200 years, but we sure should be doing something about it so that everyone, like Harry and Line Bradley wanted, everyone has an opportunity. There's dignity in every person, and there's dignity when it comes to um, uh, working and contributing to society. We, we, we just don't think in those terms. Too many people don't think in those terms these days, um, and it's sad. I, I wanted to, um, I guess, delve a bit deeper into some of the, and I had queued up a few questions on this because, as you said, um, you know, the foundation does promote fair and free trade, you know, no tariffs, and that's something also that, um, you know, pre obviously President Trump has taken a different approach on and that there's been um, reports about how that has affected, you know, some people in their jobs and, and families' ability to, to work in certain industries. Um, can you elaborate a bit more about why you still think that fair trade is, is, is the way to go and the impact that not continuing in that route has for the country? And well, uh, I mean, I guess we think with free and fair trade, with limited government interference, markets will work and people will be successful and some people won't be. Um, it, it, it's an opportunity to live that dream, to build a company. Um, maybe you're gonna fail, but maybe you'll be wildly successful uh, beyond all your dreams and, and, and with government deciding who's going to win and who's going to lose, they're no more qualified than anyone else. They're just people like you and me. Um, it, it, it's just not a fair way to give people the chance to, to build what they want to build. Um, now, Trump would say, I think, um, uh, you know, ultimately he hopes the tariffs go away and that this is a, a step along the way to get to that. We'll see. Uh, if he has that opportunity and if that's uh, in fact true. Um, there are some things he's done in China, taking China to task um, and um, uh, with the whole situation with China that, that I think probably has been the right thing to do that past uh, presidents have not done. Um, but getting back to the main point, the less regulation, the less interference, the more opportunity we think there are for people in this country um, to have incredible lives. Uh, and, and for the most part, 
uh, it's worked. I mean, before the pandemic hit, um, even with some tariffs, uh, the economy of this country was pretty incredible uh, for all people. Um, that's in part because of the system here that allows people from the bottom up to make their lives as opposed to a set of elite bureaucrats that somehow know better than the rest of the people. That's the difference. That's why America is different from so many countries around the world. Another issue that's pretty related to that too that um, I know you have you awarded a grant this year to an organization called the Millennial Debt Foundation. Yes. Um, and they <coughs> are focused not so much on the debt that millennials likely have from going to college and st student debt, but they are focused on the federal debt and the... It's the, out of control. And so that's another issue that we don't really see talked about much in campaigns and on the Republican Party side. Um, but what are your thoughts on why that should, is still a relevant issue and should be some, you know, a matter of concern? Uh, our, our debt as a percentage of GDP uh, is reaching record levels. Um, it's a real shame that there isn't more discussion about it. I think it's a, t uh, a big problem. And, and again, it's another example of what we're doing as a foundation is a little bit different than uh, the, the political people <clears throat> are doing right now. Um, it, it's going to be a bigger issue for you than it is for me. Uh, but unless something is done with entitlements, with Social Security, with, with the other entitlements that are growing bigger and bigger, um, it, it, at some point it becomes unsustainable. It, it's like your own household. Um, if the debt gets too high, at some point it doesn't work anymore. And uh, people don't like to believe it or politicians are, don't have the guts to face it because it's unpleasant, because it's taking something away. Um, nonetheless, it has to be talked about. There have been times in the past, uh, Paul Ryan talked about it earlier in his career, got nowhere. Uh, George Bush talked about it uh, a, a little bit, got nowhere. Um, politicians have to wake up soon. And yes, we've been through a pandemic. It's been an extraordinary time, probably appropriately a time for the government to spend some money to help people in need. Uh, but we are, we are nearing crisis stage. And um, as a foundation, yes, we will be supporting organizations that look at this issue, that talk about this issue. Whether it gets traction or not, I don't know. In a Trump administration, a second Trump administration, maybe someone will listen. In a Biden uh, administration, you can be pretty sure that it won't be dealt with at all. Yeah, I was going to ask, I mean, how do you get people to get traction on that issue? It's and probably I mean, going to take a crisis. I, <laughs> I mean, and that's too bad. Um, that, that it takes that, that you can't think in advance a little bit. But it, um, I mean, you've seen the political ads that happen when people talk about it. They're, you know, they're taking money away from grandma and grandpa and pushing them off the side of a hill and ridiculous things like that. This is a great example of a topic where you just can't have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to as a country. It's, it's, it's just common sense that when the numbers get to the point where they're quickly approaching, you've got a problem and you've got to deal with it. And I think it's fair to note, though, that, I mean, the spending, I mean, the spending over the, the last several Republican administrations has, has been quite high as compared to what we saw like, during the Clinton administration. I know he raised taxes, and obviously that, you know, Republicans would disagree with that. But, I mean, we've seen the deficit, you know, Soar under Bush. I mean, I know with the and pandemic under, and under under Obama, Obama. it went and then way with, up. And Trump's Obama. been a huge spender, even I think prior to the pandemic. And so, I mean, uh, yeah. And he's never know. focused on the entitlements. I and um, I wish he would. Are there any other issues that that um, the foundation's looking at that you feel like are good ins for bipartisan um, that we've seen both parties have a concern for, or both you know liberals and conservatives that. Are issues to come together on? Well, I've, I've talked about it several times during our conversation. I, I wish education was one of those. I, I, I wish parental choice was not controversial. I don't know why it is, the, the notion that parents should be able to decide where their kids go to school. Um, 
boy, the, the deficit and the debt issues, uh, again, you, you wish would be issues that people could talk about. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, you know, free trade, there, there, there's been some bipartisanship on that over the years. I think people look at it differently. I think um, the left has been more in favor of multinational uh, arrangements, the, the um, TPP and, and the other Pacific and, and European uh, trade deals that were worked on. But, you know, I, I, there, that, that's been an area where there's been uh, some conversation. Um, Tax reform, not a whole lot of common ground there uh, that I've seen. Um, I'm not being very optimistic, am I, in, in finding <laughs> issues that uh, both sides can come to the table on. Well, one issue... They do, they do all seem to agree on spending more money yeah. and raising the, the spending cap, which is just wrong. I was going to say, one issue that there has been bipartisan movement on that I wanted to get your thoughts on is... Uh, the movement to uh, eliminate hyperpartisan gerrymandering in the states. There's been, there's bipartisan, you know, movement and consensus in some states to establish independent redistricting commissions. I think similar to what exists in Iowa, um, and I'm, you know, and I'm sure that there's a variety of ways potentially to approach that issue. But I know the Bradley Foundation gave a hundred thousand dollars to an organization called Fair Lines America which has worked against initiatives to establish those types of commissions in several states. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about that issue and what is it about um, independent redistricting commissions that, that you guys don't agree with and what that group is, is trying to do. Well, I mean, we, we should be clear. That, that organization that we funded is a 501c3 that is really just an educational organization. It hasn't been advocating. It, it provides information to people on redistricting. It provides data, statistics, that sort of thing. Um, but I'll take my Bradley hat off. I, I mean, I've been through this process here in the state, state of Wisconsin on redistricting and so forth, and there is no perfect system. And frankly, there is no such thing as a nonpartisan commission. Everyone's partisan. Um, the Republicans want a better map for Republican candidates, and the Democrats want a better map for Democratic candidates, and I get that. Um, the, the system here that goes through the state legislature and the governor, and if there's still disagreement, ultimately the courts, um, uh, it, it is a system that I think works just as well as so-called nonpartisan commissions that really don't exist. Um, so it, it, it's an imperfect uh, way to do it. No one's ever going to be entirely happy. But th this notion that you can bring together a group of people that don't have opinions um, is, is, I think, naive. Well, I think that some might say that maybe nonpartisan is, is, I mean, yeah, n that's fair. No one is completely objective and devoid of ideas, but maybe more bipartisan, um, yeah, maybe just more bipartisan in a way that that is more fair than if than what we see, you know, a lot of folks have said that. Well, there's a lot of complaining in this state, and what it really right. is, the Democrats saying we want districts where, uh, that are better for us. Well, if you sit on the other side of the aisle, that doesn't seem so fair. So, it, I mean, it, it, it's a partisan issue. There is no perfect process, and from what I have seen, these independent commissions produce about the same results as the the a process that you have, like in the state of Wisconsin. Is that issue in general one that um, is a focus for the foundation or in the scheme of kind of all the other grants? It's not a big do? focus. It, um, you know, it, it, it's one of hundreds of grants that we make every year. So, um, Looking ahead for you, you know, in your role, what, what's on your agenda as far as what you are planning for the rest of this year in 2021? Um, yeah, what are your biggest goals and what are some of the biggest challenges in your job right now? Well, well, you know, I say we don't get involved in politics, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens um, with the election and, and whether that changes priorities in any way. But again, we're in this for the long haul. Um, so. On the other hand, regardless of what happens, we're going to keep doing what we're doing, and that is constitutional order. That means organizations that believe in our system of federalism, 
our separation of powers. I think there's been a breakdown uh, in our separation of powers. I think the legislative branch has ceded tremendous authority to the administrative branch, and I think that's wrong. And I think that's something that, you know, I would hope that there's an issue that I would hope both sides could agree on, that the, that the Congress has abdicated responsibility to the executive branch, and that's wrong. That's not what the founders wanted. So we'll continue focusing on that. Um, our individual liberties, our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion uh, are in jeopardy. When kids on campus or even conservative-leaning professors on a campus are afraid to speak, that's a problem um, that is not consistent with what should be going on in this country. So we will continue to fight those fights. Uh, we've talked about free markets. We'll, we've talked about informed citizens and, and what that means on, on the education front. There's a great need, I think, for more civics education and history education uh, in this country. There's, I, I think, a profound lack of understanding of uh, the way we govern ourselves. I, I think there are um, frightening things happening in um, the world of education right now that, that need to be um, resisted. The 1619 Project of the New York Times, which is predicated on, on, on the premise that this country was founded, that the American Revolution was fought to um, sustain slavery. It's just wrong. And, and the, the finest historians in this country, the most preeminent historians have said that is just false. The Declaration of Independence it, itself uh, refutes that. So that kind of misinformation, that kind of false narrative is very dangerous and we will continue to fight and, and resist that sort of thing. And we'll continue uh, trying to build the strongest civil society we can in our community and across the community and that's continuing to fund the arts and continuing to um, focus on those great organizations that person by person are making an incredible difference. Uh, can There's I, a lot in there. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> um, I guess, well, a couple, a couple things just looking at the time we have. So I wanted to follow up just on your note about uh, the, when we're talking about the Congress ceding power to yes. the executive. Are you talking really just on the federal level and or, and or how well, do you I think see it's, what? I think it's probably true across the board. I think it's most problematic at the federal level. What do you make of what we saw in Wisconsin then when Governor Evers was elected and we saw the legislature, I mean, we, we saw the legislature come in and do a variety of things to kind of take away powers from what he and or the attorney general could do at the time. And um, I mean, we saw that in Wisconsin and in North Carolina. Um, and I think that I'm some talking, might... I'm talking more about regulation, about legislators passing a law that is very general in nature that then goes to unelected bureaucrats saying implement this without any guidance, without any real thought as to what it might mean. So you've got people that weren't elected controlling huge parts of our lives and that I don't think was what was intended. So you're talking more about like the administrative rule process exactly. too and yes. we, yes. and in Wisconsin. The administrative state. Yeah. Yes. And so there should be more, you're saying that there should be more um, real specificity about what the law is prescribing. I think, or the, I think the legislators, the people that are making the laws ought to do their jobs. Uh, and, and I think in a lot of cases, they're not doing their jobs. They're abdicating that to unelected bureaucrats who are part of the executive branch. Um, so I guess then jumping back again to your thoughts on the New York Times 1619 project. Yeah. Um, can you, I guess, elaborate on that a bit more and talk about what, you know, then your understanding about the role, what they get wrong, I guess, about the ways in which slavery really, you know, their argument I think would be that slavery as an institution permeated through our country and really co-opted what though what the founders intended that, because of course that wasn't true for black people at slavery, the time. Slavery had existed for centuries around the world and it took America to end it. It took brave people like Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant and, and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives fighting a civil war to bring that institution, which is a blemish on the American experiment, 
a blemish to an end. But to suggest, to rewrite history, and to suggest that it was the basis, it was the reason for the Civil War uh, and, and for the founding of this country is wrong. All evidence suggests that it is just flat out inaccurate. Yet, the 1619 Project is, is becoming part of the um, curricula of, of schools across this country. So kids aren't learning true American history uh, in, in, in any way that's accurate, and that's dangerous. That, that is part of an effort to destroy the institutions of this country, and I think that is just flat out dangerous. We're forgetting what this country provides and what it offers and what it has given to so many people. There is, this is still the greatest land of opportunity. And to tear that down, to tear that apart, I think is very, very scary, dangerous, and wrong. And we ought to do everything we can to fight that. I'm just curious, can you talk about, so it's... And it's it not perfect now either. I was born in the late 1950s. We've made great progress during that period of time um, in, in terms of racial relations in this country. Great progress. Is it perfect? No. Is what happened this summer um, acceptable? No. But it is not a reason to destroy this country, to loot our cities, to destroy people's livelihoods, um, and, and to do it in a way that is uncompromising and uh, uh, in a way that does not allow for any of the discourse that we've talked about. It's so, either their way or no way, and their way is wrong. When you say that it's part of a deliberate effort to destroy institutions, are, are you that. saying that, that, it's the, that the New York Times purposefully created this in an attempt to destroy like educational institutions, or what I think you, I what think it is a that? completely false narrative uh, that is going at all that has been built in this country. I think they are trying, I mean, you see what's going on in this country in, in cities. Looting, destruction, um, everyone's a racist. Um, it, it, it's just not right. It's just not right. And the way to get at it, and we have, we'll come back to it again, are to really sit down and have some really good conversations about education and family and, and things that can raise and create the opportunities for every single person in this country. Now, they're always going to be bad actors. That, that, that's always going to happen. But we ought to start out with the premise that every single person in the United States of America should have, should have an opportunity to live their life in freedom uh, and to do it the way that they want to do it. And if you don't have an education, it's going to be hard to accomplish that. So those are the things that we should be aspiring to. And again, any time you've got hundreds of millions of people, it's not going to be perfect, but it sure can be better. A whole lot better than running around destroying cities and, and livelihoods and statues. Do you think that the idea of systemic racism, which is a, a lot of what that project promoted, is antithetical to conservatism? Or the, conserv the conservatism uh, I, I, that the... I think it goes back to this tribalistic uh, approach that, that so many on the left are promoting, that everyone's a victim, that, um, that uh, you know, that we're not Americans, we're part of a different tribe and we're going to fight with each other and we're entitled to whatever we deserve as a tribe as opposed to we've got a pretty good thing in this country, how do we make it better? How do we work together to make it better and how do we solve some of these problems that I think are not being solved um, with the, the rhetoric and acts that are, have gone on in this country over the last five or six months. Do you not think that tribalism is also a part of the conservative or propagated by the conservative movement too? It's not consistent with what Harry and Lyon Bradley would think. Not at all. Not for one minute. And it's not the way they operated their company. It's not the way they live their lives. And it's not the way we operate at the Bradley Foundation. Absolutely not.
Is there anything else that I didn't ask you that you think is important to say? Caitlin, you've asked me everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, um, this is kind of a, not really much to do with politics, but I was going to ask you what, what you, um, you know, just personally, what you wish you knew, what you wish you knew when you were in your 20s and 30s, or if you could go back <laughs> in time and give yourself a piece of advice when you were just starting out in your career, what would it, what would it be? You know, the be you, you learn a lot through a career uh, and through just being around for a while. Um, sort of cliche, but I, I wish I had known then what I know today, and I wish I had had those life experiences. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I was trying to build a law practice, and um, you just worry about cranking out the billable hours and finding clients, and I, I didn't, I don't think I spent enough time thinking about how fortunate I was and spend enough time giving back, taking a break from those billable hours and volunteering a little bit or doing something in the community or the state or the country uh, that would have added a little bit of value in my own way. I didn't do that. I think I got too caught up in um, finding the next client in the next billable hour taking a breath, I guess. Uh, but I don't think you get that, or I would have gotten that at that point because I didn't have that life experience. I didn't have those six years in Europe, that incredible time in Prague that, that gave me such a different perspective. Or, or frankly, the, the last four years at Bradley where it's now part of my job to read a lot and think a lot about those things. Um, which is a wonderful part of my job, but it's not part of the job that I had in, in prior lives and prior careers. Um, that's part of life though. I guess it's all part of building something and, and learning and that's, that's the incredible experience that we all have in this country as Americans. Yeah, well, thank you so much again for joining Thanks, us. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, thanks. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsor. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com. WKOW Channel 27 and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a CapTimes member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com.